episode of Surviving the Survivor, we bring you the best guests in all of true crime. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button. Here's your host, Emmy Award-winning broadcaster, Joel Walton. What's up, SGS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in all of true crime. And those who've been with us for a while know that uh, despite the dark subject matter often involved in true crime, we've managed to have fun and uh, joke around it. I'm sure that will happen tonight, but I just want to emphasize that these shows that we do about Ellen Greenberg that we're about to do uh, to me are the most important. Um, And I said this yesterday, they don't always get the strongest numbers. I do not care. This story is, in my opinion, the most important one that we that we do, because this is a family who you're about to meet uh, that has not only not gotten justice, um, and look at this, uh, it's coming from around the world here, um, love and support to Sandy and Josh from Tel Aviv, from Ethan Henschel. So this is a story now that has garnered global attention, but these are parents who not only have not gotten justice for their daughter, this is a case that has not been investigated uh, since her death back in 2011. So it is a horror show for them. And as we go through this, you will see the absolute level, in my opinion, of corruption here and lack of responsibility by some of the highest elected officials in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And we are going to call them out tonight. Um, but before that, let me just give you a uh, a breakdown of what this story is all about, and then we'll get into some of uh, the nitty gritty, and I'll introduce the best guest. I hope this doesn't cover her face. Uh, there we go. Um, on January 26, 2011, uh, Ellen Greenberg, she was a teacher at a local school outside Philadelphia. She was found dead by her fiance, a guy named Sam Goldberg. Uh, this was inside the unit at a place called the Venice Loft Condominiums in a very tony area called Maniunk, uh, kind of a hipster area. Uh, her fiance, Sam Goldberg, was allegedly returning for the g- from the gym. Uh, it was a very snowy night, a nor'easter was rolling in, and he told police that he found the apartment door locked and had to break in to get back inside. And remember that, because that break in, we'll, we'll circle back to that. He had a break inside where he found Ellen seated on the kitchen floor. This is according to court documents. An autopsy the next day revealed that uh, Ellen had suffered 20 stab wounds to her chest, abdomen, head, and neck. 20, you heard me right. A knife was also found embedded 10 centimeters into her chest. Philadelphia's then medical examiner, Dr. Marlon Osborne, initially ruled Ellen's death a homicide. Lo and behold, on February 28th of 2011, The Philadelphia Police Department comes in and declares her death to be ruled a suicide. A couple months later, uh, two months later, to be precise, less than two months, April 4th of 2011, um, Osborne, this medical examiner, formally amends the manner of death on Ellen's death certificate from homicide to suicide. The good news in all this, if there is a silver lining, is that the fight is far from over uh, and there was actually a nice big win in a court case, uh, something the Greenbergs need uh, just this week. So without further ado, let me uh, introduce uh, the guests. And by the way, uh, we're going to be talking about some difficult things, but uh, the the, the Greenbergs have seen these photos before. I'm going to put this up just to give you an idea of what we're talking about here. Uh, Anyone who's not outraged by this, I don't get it, but this is uh, imagery of what happened to Ellen uh, right here. Um, This is the evidence, uh, the knife, uh, the amount of stab wounds, and this is ruled a suicide. We'll get into those two knife wounds uh, to the back of the neck and the spine. Um, Of course, we're joined by uh, Ellen's parents on the bottom left here, Josh and Sandy Greenberg. Great to have them back. And then Joe Pedroza. Uh, Pedraza, excuse me. Um, he is a partner with Lamb McEarlane uh, and practices in the specialties of complex civil litigation, commercial litigation, healthcare litigation, and uh, the list goes on. But the bottom line is 
Uh, he's a very competent Philadelphia attorney, and he is now and has been for a while representing uh, the Greenbergs in what is uh, a very um, high and mounting um, legal bill. Uh, the amount of money that the Greenbergs have spent so far uh, to try to get answers about their daughter exceeds a half a million dollars. Um, last but not least, top right corner, Gavin Fish. He's a journalist, a documentarian, a YouTuber, a champion from, for victims of violent crimes and their families. He works to give a voice to the voiceless and to bring justice to those who've been victimized by corruption and acrimony. He sits on the board of directors of All the Lost Girls, which is a nonprofit that focuses on female strangulation, cold cases in the United States. He's won a ton of awards and he's a reporter on the crime beat for EYT Media in Western Pennsylvania. So crime reporting uh, is his day job as well. Um, <clears throat> Is it true, Josh and Sandy? Josh, let's start with you. Um, and before I even get there, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, how are the two of you doing? I mean, this was a good week for you, I'd say. How are you both holding up, Josh, first? I think we're holding up very well. I think aside from this week, we've had a number of victories, which had only taken 13 years to achieve, not because of any incompetence on the part of Mr. Pedraza or his team, but just on the uh goal of the city of philadelphia and i would also include uh, my my friend my friend josh shapiro the new governor when he was uh, attorney general has to block everything they could do to keep us out of court and anytime they did allow us to be in court they did with the most inane deals they could come up with that they presented to us things that were totally unacceptable and just ridiculous. But we feel pretty good right now. Uh, I want to just offer my feelings. I'm getting congratulated by the people that surround me and that are cheering us on. And I actually feel nothing. After 13 years of getting, you know, pushed away, shoved away, disposed of, I can't even get excited about this, even though I know it's a milestone. Well, I, I, that's okay. That's my feeling. Uh, no, everyone's feelings is their feelings. But I, I see things happening after 13 years that we, you never saw. Uh, the mid-range court, I'm going to call because I don't know the names. Mr. Pedraza may fill in the names of the various courts. Wrote a 30-page document, 32-page document, which two pages were saying that we don't have standing to go ahead and 30 pages of why we should find out what's happened to our daughter. A lower court judge wrote a 16-page document. You know, I'm talking about legal documents. I'm not talking about a hand, a, uh, uh, just something written up on a piece of paper. I'm talking these were footnoted. They had the all the legal, I would call it technology or ease that, that they should have in a real legal document. So these weren't written at night, some night, while he's watching uh, this podcast. These were written with professional legal incentives. And I think we should be very proud of that. We had what we would call, I would call, and I'm not a lawyer, but a major victory where the city tried to block us from having depositions and going on with the case that we have going regarding the medical examiner's blatant, uh, blatant actions to uh, cover up a homicide. Literally cover up a homicide and make it look like a suicide. Uh, I may be stepping out of bounds, but I have my attorney here, so I'm yeah. feeling pretty comfortable. But let's see. Uh, uh, I don't want to end the court over this, but this is where it is. And I'm make really no mistake. I think, uh, Josh, I think what you're saying, I, I think people are afraid to say it, but this is exactly what happened. Um, and I'm glad that you're saying that. And you're saying in the presence of your attorney, um, by the way, GGA says, I live in central Pennsylvania, sent Governor Shapiro a text. I just want to put this up. Uh, the way to, uh, you know, exact change is to go after these uh, politicians. Um, they're a little too comfortable in their uh, seats there in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And this is the information. I'm going to leave this up for a while. I'd love everyone to text Josh Shapiro. Go ahead and call Larry Krasner. Um, these guys are partly responsible for what's going on here. Josh Shapiro, obviously, uh, you know, 
the the top dog in the Commonwealth, and uh, he needs to be held accountable as well. Um, Gavin, uh, there's no one who has reported on this more extensively, I don't think, than Gavin Fish. Uh, he's got a brain full of knowledge about this. Um, I'm, I have a pittance compared to him. Um, Gavin, are, are you um, emboldened a little bit? Is, it, is this the sort of the best streak that you've seen in a while for the Greenberg family with this win in court? Well, the Greenbergs, through Joe and Will, their attorneys are are racking up some some wins. They've been dealt a couple of pretty hard losses. I understand what you said, Sandy, that you feel nothing because it it's just up and down and up and down and up and down. I have to say, though, uh, attending the hearing where you know Joe, on your behalf, was uh, making the case to Judge Carpenter why. They should be able to depose Guy DeAndrea. I thought that I I felt I think emboldened is a good word. I felt like we've got somebody here who's no nonsense, who thinks that the case has merit and uh, is letting you move forward uh, within pretty, uh, pretty narrow confines, I think is probably a, a fair way to say that. But she is letting Joe move forward with a uh, deposition of Guy DeAndrea. And I think that's going to be huge. Um, I just want to say this. Number one, please reach out to the elected officials. Number two, I'm going to, I'm going to beseech this of you a few times during this podcast. And it has nothing to do with me. I promise, but please share and retweet this episode. Just imagine I've got three kids. You have a daughter and uh, she's murdered. And then you've got corrupt officials who tell you and try to, you know, um, explain to you that somehow this, this crazy death was a suicide. Um, it's just, it's an unbearable thing to, to imagine what the Shapiro's, uh, what the Greenbergs, I'm sorry, are going through here, specifically Josh Shapiro. And, um, you know, we've got to put ourselves in their shoes and, uh, realize that, um, they've been to hell and, and back and they're not quite out of it yet. So, um, Let's please support them. The best way here is to uh, share and retweet this episode and to reach out to Josh Shapiro, the governor. Now, a Philadelphia shoulder surgeon and I become friendly because of this case. She's reached out. Uh, Joe, this question is for you. Um, I grew up on the main line and it astonishes me how many people are unaware of this. I have ideas for how to spread the message, but how do you think the best way to raise awareness is? What can the people of Philadelphia, the people of the Commonwealth, and people who are in Israel or the Republic of Ireland that are regulars in this podcast, what can they do to help? Well, we've actually had extensive support from the media itself on both the uh, international, national, and local level. Uh, Local uh, newscasts have uh, been supportive. Uh, It's programs like this. If people take an interest and pass them along, um, it helps build attention to the case. And I, I personally have always felt that but for the media's attention to this matter, we probably would have been stopped years ago from going forward uh, with this litigation due to some judicial doctrine or some what I would call nonsensical claim that would end the case. But with the media keeping an eye on this matter, actually attending court hearings and monitoring and letting jurists know that they're there and they're not going away because they feel strongly that the case needs to be presented to 12 people and let 12 people decide whether we're right or we're wrong. Um, I guess that's really all we can do right now. And then, you know, Joel, it's your program here. And what you just besiege your uh, viewers to do is to pass it on to others and to speak to others about it. Um, the loss for the Greenbergs of their daughter and the injustice is not limited to just this one family. This is the system. And the system will not change unless we all bring change to it. And there I have to say for Josh and Sandy, they've been so devoted to making sure that justice is obtained. Uh, They're doing this not just for themselves. They're doing it for everybody in this court system. This case has actually exposed problems with the medical examiner's office in Philadelphia that finally got officials to go in and begin to clean out that office. You have to ask yourself, how many people have been convicted 
who perhaps should not be in jail, but for um, substandard work by the medical examiner's office in Philadelphia. So the, the case carries a lot more than just the immediate needs of Sandy and Josh. It truly impacts virtually every citizen in Southeast Pennsylvania who's ever had any type of criminal involvement that involved the medical examiner's office. And, and if so, I can just hop in there real quick, Joel, uh, what Joe just down. said is so important. It's not just in Pennsylvania either. The medical examiner system throughout the entire United States is insulated from any criticism or oversight almost completely across the board. And this is a very small community represented by a very powerful association and lobby. And no, in nowhere in, in the nation have am I aware of anybody who has been able to get any type of oversight from the medical examiner system. And I've told Josh and Sandy this from the beginning, if they can do that, they will have pierced a veil that has been bulletproof since, since medical examiner, that system took over across the nation. It's huge. And, and, uh, what, what, it seems like, Mr. Josh, it seems like you're on your way to doing it. Go ahead, Josh. What Mr. Pedraza and, and Mr. Gavin said, let me, I'm going to make it into lay terms. No one can challenge the medical examiner's conclusion. They're above the law, and that's the way they are right now in this country. So if you or a loved one should die under unusual circumstances or usual circumstances, and the medical examiner, their conclusion is something that you may not agree with, that uh, I don't know what. We don't think Ellen committed suicide. I, I, I know that Ellen did not like pain, and I know that after talking to certain experts in this field, Pain is not what women suffer when they commit suicide. It is terribly, terribly, terribly unusual for Ellen to have a suicide with this type of method. She would definitely have gone for something painless. So that, I mean, if you go on Google it, you're not going to find any other victims but Ellen. And when Sandy and I started this, it was just for Ellen. But now we do feel that there are others who have been hurt by the system. How can somebody make a conclusion and know that he or she or they are 100% correct? Uh, and we, we are gonna go through some of these details and some of them are not pretty. And I, I just beg everyone to be patient as we go through this. And again, please pester the elected officials um, and make your voices heard on this case. Um, you're, you're hearing Gavin say this and Joe Pedraza. Um, it, it could happen to anybody. Anyone could have a, a freak death or be murdered. And if the medical examiner rules one way, uh, like you heard, uh, I think it was Gavin who just said, they're bulletproof. There's nothing you can do. Uh, Let's say if somebody dies in a car accident and there was a bottle of liquor next to them. Mm -hmm. The medical examiner could say they were intoxicated. Mm -hmm. Even though they might not be intoxicated that's, that's how all it works yeah uh rose shiflet here mr pedraza why can't and this question is asked often why can't the feds be brought in on this tiff knox says gaslighters which is the word i was searching for earlier sometimes the words escape me but it, it appears the commonwealth has just completely gaslighted the greenbergs this entire time uh saying oh no you guys are crazy it was a suicide um why can't we get um to use Hebrew nationals expression, a higher authority here, like the feds and get the FBI in here. Uh, well, you, you always hear on the uh, uh, shows, uh, crime shows, you know, the feds step in and they correct the wrong. Uh, in actuality, uh, federal power in this area is very limited. And uh, there have been overtures made to different federal authorities, uh, including Department of Justice. And at this juncture, until you can establish certain predicate facts, they won't touch it. It stays down at the local level. But I also have to say, um, Joel, it's been three three years, no, excuse me, uh, almost four or five years. And we have just recently in the last two months obtained the Philadelphia Police Department file. So there's a lot of information that has been unknown until about three months ago that we are given this material to finally see what investigation, what type of investigation did they actually do? 
Who did they speak with? What did these people say? And what else did the Philadelphia Police Department know? Because we've really been somewhat. Um, well, I just want to make sure I'm hearing that right. Do you, are you saying you only got the police file three months ago for this case? Less than. Yeah, less than. It's it's. We have been asking for it for over the five years. It took that long with the pandemic. And then with uh, certain privileges, et cetera. And it wasn't until October of last year and November that the same judge, Judge Carpenter, stepped in and said, look, um, I want you guys, meeting the city, to turn over the files. Give them the full medical examiner's uh, file and give the plaintiff attorney, Mr. Pedraza, you know, the entire Philadelphia Police Department file. From that point forward, it took... Up to even last week, in fact, um, like Thursday of last week, we're still having a production of the file on a glacial scale, let's put it that way, or speed. So we're still learning more about the internal developments of this investigation that we did not know over the last five years. And of course, and they could deliver that discovery immediately. They did it to the attorney general's office. They did it to the Chester County District Attorney's office. That uh, that sort, they do not have to move at the pace that they're moving. They could just turn it over. It is digitized. It is it is set to go. And one of the things that I really loved about what Judge Carpenter said back in November is uh, when the arguments about immunity and things like that for uh, for the medical examiners were brought up by the defense. Judge Carpenter said there has to be somebody with the power to oversee them. And I don't know if it's me, but somebody does. So turn over the discovery. And it was it it was a moment that was that was really powerful. I was really glad that she did that because Gavin, so, is it ac is it accurate to say that this case has never been investigated since 2011? Is that an accurate statement? Mm. Man, that's a uh, let's say semi investigated. Well, it was investigated by Guy D'Andrea. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and we're we're gonna get him. Yeah, we're going to get to him in just one minute. And Josh, I'm going to let you bounce in. Uh, you can also uh, not stab yourself after you are dead. Uh, Josh, just explain this since you're about to get going. I mean, there was an independent autopsy done, and two of the wounds to your daughter were post-mortem. Is that right? The, the, the medical examiner's office brought in another expert to review wounds. And she testified at her deposition. deposition that there was no blood on these wounds. If there's no blood, that means there was no pulse or pushing through of blood in the body. And what I think is even more startling and revealing here is we she testified in 2018, I believe. And she was asked when she looked at the wound, the material. And she said 2015. And I believe she was asked, why was there no report? And she was, she testified, I was told not to write one. That to me is worse than making mistakes. To me, that is blatant misconduct. If I could find a better word than blatant misconduct, I would, but I'm at a loss. I also when, want to say- When Josh says thing. she was asked- I'm sorry? When Josh is saying she, she was asked these questions, she was asked these questions by Joe. Joe yeah. really probed in on that. Yes. They had no idea about the lack of vital reaction until that line of questioning. It was really shocking. Yeah. And she was under oath. What, and she did it on video. But I want to bring up something here that's, that, that uh, um, I forgot it already. God darn it. Well, well, listen, I mean, the most important thing here, uh, we can break that down as much as you want, but just think about this logically. Two of the 20 stab wounds and 10 were to the back, back of the neck, back of the head. Two of them came post-mortem, meaning right. that Alan was already dead. Uh, it's hard to commit suicide uh, once you're already dead. People are still on this um, medical examiner uh, issue here, Joe. Uh, you're the attorney. Are they protected? Are they completely immune from prosecution? Well, it's uh, the ruling that hmm. we received here is the answer would be yes, from civil responsibility, whether it be in equity or in law for damages, uh, the decision was made that families and estates do not have standing. They don't have the right to sue, no matter how egregious or how wrong the decision is. It's what we call arbitrary and capricious, meaning that reasonable people would not agree with this under any circumstance. 
even if you meet that standard, Pennsylvania now says that you still can't do anything about it. You're powerless. And Joel, let me just speak one again, just a little bit about this coroner um, uh, medical examiner. In Pennsylvania, for instance, every county has a coroner slash pathologist, but only Pittsburgh and a few other areas like Philadelphia, Harrisburg, possibly a few counties outside of Philly actually have physicians who are pathologists who actually perform that task. Everywhere else, it's done by a layperson, and the laypersons voted in, and they they have no medical experience, and they're then given a, a course, a short course that they go to, and then they're put out there to be the coroner in that county to decide manner of death and, and other matters that impact families and uh, folks who live in that county. These are the people that we're giving absolute power to to make decisions along these lines, which is, it's, it's stunning. And it's one of the reasons why Josh and Sandy demanded that we go to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court and see if they will take this and reverse that part of the decision of the lower appellate court so that everybody in this uh, state then would be allowed to challenge um, coroners, pathologists, uh, determinations uh, when they are arbitrary and capricious. I almost feel like, though, like um, Philadelphia County is special in the Commonwealth in that they don't have a coroner. I know that Allegheny County does not have a coroner. They have simply medical examiners, and I think they're the only two. There might be one more. But anyway, in a coroner situation, you've got an elected official that has pressure on them. So if a coroner, plus they have the power of the coroner's inquest. So even if they did not it, say they came came down with the wrong cause and manner, um, they could still call a jury basically, and they could present their case to the jury and the jury could decide. Uh, and then the second part of that is they, they are accountable to the people, but in Philadelphia County, they got rid of the coroner system. Therefore they are accountable to no one. It appears there's, there's no oversight of the medical examiner process. I'm going to throw out something that's kind of scary if, if you live in Philadelphia. If we're correct, there's a murderer loose in Philadelphia, or murderers, plural. Because Ellen was murdered, and whoever did it is still out there. Yeah, it could be in New York City. Uh, I'm just saying. Uh, we'll get into some of that in a little bit. Um, Cindy, a few people have asked, uh, 2020 Dateline or 48 Hours done a story on this. The answer is no, and the answer... Uh, as to why it is no, is because there's no ending. They're, they're, those they, shows, need a, they need a conclusion, so they, they don't get sued. Or, yeah. I don't know if you guys noticed, though, but all three of those programs were represented by a producer in the, in the courtroom this week. Yeah. Okay, that's I did not know that, and that's great to know, which means they're moving on it. And I know at one point there's some talk about documentaries being done, which I hope happens. I hope Netflix... Uh, is in on this. I, this needs to be exposed. I mean, look at these photos for a minute um, of Ellen as a young child with sand. I mean, I have my own kids and I look at this. I'm like, this is, this is crazy. I mean, it's absolute insanity. Sandy, um, I, you know, when you said that you're numb, the first thing I could think of is my own father who passed away a year ago. And I, I still feel numb. I, and that, you know, he lived to almost 90 years old. He wasn't you're a child. Sure that was taken from me, but Sandy, let everyone know too, because this um, wasn't just um, a regular Joe fiance. Um, and I'm not saying he did it, but I'm saying his relatives were pretty powerful. Who's his uncle? And the, can you tell us what happened that night? His, he, before he called 911, there were several phone calls according to the phone records that he made. I um, think Joe, I let Joe answer yeah. this question. Okay, we Joe. Will feel more there are, yeah. We don't want to do, we have been very careful for these 13 uh -huh. years not to point figures or do anything like that. And I don't want to make a mistake today. So okay. I would like Joe to answer that question and let him make the mistake. Joe, I just think I, <laughs> the reason I bring the question up, Joe, the reason I bring that question up is the relatives are fairly powerful. Someone in, in the chat said that the uncle is still some sort of uh, some sort of pre like 
president role of a some kind of judicial something or other. So if you can, as the lawyer, explain who these people are. Well, the uncle is a, uh, a practicing uh, white collar criminal crime uh, lawyer many, many years. Yes, he had held uh, uh, official positions uh, appointed or um, yeah, basically appointed by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Uh, I don't believe he presently does now. Um, the family itself is a prominent family uh, on the, what we call the main line in uh, outside of Philadelphia, generally uh, uh, higher income folks where they live. Um, and um, the, you know, they certainly have a lot of friends. I I'm not sure whether that really comes to bear in this particular case um, because there's just so many different circumstances. But I think how I'd like to frame it, Joel, is let's look at what, what was the determination according to the pathologist Osborne that made him change it from homicide to suicide. And he said it was really two things. One, that um, a neuropathologist who was eminently qualified by the name of Dr. Lucy Rourke, um, she was not with the office. She's actually with a healthcare institution in Philly, but was contracted with the office. Uh, he claimed that he presented a sample of Ellen's, her spinal injury, and that uh, Dr. Lucy Rourke said, um, no, that wouldn't have kept her from continuing to stab herself, and therefore she could have continued to stab herself. The second thing that Osborne said was, I was told, this is Osborne saying this, that the fiancé was escorted when he broke through the door and found Ellen in her condition. I can tell you as to that second point, the police department uh, file that's been turned over to date completely discredits any claim that the fiance was escorted. In fact, the fiance gave two statements to the police department and at no time did he ever contend that he was escorted or anybody was with him when he was out in the hallway. It is nowhere in the police department file. Where did that come from? We don't know where that statement came from. Somebody made that up completely. It's a complete falsehood even to the point that years later, the DA's office in answering questions of the, the, um, um, Green, uh, the Greenbergs when they were represented by somebody else, the, the office was asked point blank, was the fiance escorted? Was somebody with them? And their answer, absolutely not. So that point alone, according to Osborne, if it's in dispute, let alone that you can rebut it or refute it, he said, you have to change this from suicide to something else. Now, that's that's point one. Point two is Lucy Rourke, which is the craziest damn thing you're ever going to hear in your life. Lucy Rourke is maybe um, internationally known. Yep. Um, she is just exceptionally competent when she was practicing. Uh, she's since retired. Uh, Lucy Rourke would never, ever look at something without generating a report. And by her own statement, she said, I would always build for my services. So the crazy thing here is Osborne calls up the police department and says, yeah, I'm going to change the death certificate. Uh, I spoke with Lucy Rourke and Lucy Rourke said that that wound to the back of the spine or from the back into the spine would not have incapacitated Ellen so she could continue to stab herself. And I'm changing it. That's essentially what he says to the police department. That's what their notes say. So the police department says, hey, great. Um, why don't you send us a copy of her report? <laughs> Uh, the fax comes back in and there's a couple documents, but no Lucy Rourke report. And the only thing the fact sheet says, oh, as to Dr. Um, Lucy Rourke, uh, why don't you give Dr. Osborne a call? And that's it. About, oh, I'm going to say six months later, the DA's office, one of their chief prosecutors, it wants to look at this case a little closer. She then asked for the entire file to take a look at it, the whole police department file. And they're going to have a meeting. The day before that meeting, the assistant district attorney sends questions, like 20 questions, pointed questions. You know what uh, essentially the top five question or within it was? Where's Dr. Lucy Rourke's report? And the reason that later this... Um, pathologist in the medical examiner's office, and it was in 2019 that she actually revisited uh, and took a look at the sample. 
The only reason she did that, according to her, was Dr. Galino began to suspect that there never was any look at this by any neuropathologist, let alone Dr. Lucy Rourke, and therefore he wanted his person who had neuro background to take a look at it. And what did that person say? Postmortem wound, no hemorrhage. Postmortem means you're dead. You, co you couldn't self-administer it. What are we missing here? Why are we still fighting these headwinds when the pathologist's two points that led him to say this is a suicide have been completely discredited? Um, this is just part of the uh, aggravation of, of hearing these bits and pieces. Um, you did say, obviously, that you got the police file, which you're talking about a little bit, but I guess it begs the question, uh, less than three months ago, um, are you allowed to reveal what sort of the biggest headline from that file would be, in your opinion, Joe? Well, I, I, first off is that at no time did the police or anybody suggest that the fiancé was escorted. That That's huge. There's no witness. And, you know, what, what transpired? Well, take a look at the lock. You all you can you take a look at the internal lock and you see that the two posts on the lock are still attached. Nothing was detached. You can't break through the door and through that lock without one or both of their the connections giving way. It's just impossible. So there's a real question as to access into those premises. The other thing was, um, and I had not shared this before, but since you've been a very strong advocate. There was actually blood found in another room. Mm. And it's noted in the police department file, but it was never followed up on. And uh, there was no ex uh, um, exams or anything else done with it. And then, of course, we got from the DA's office um, that it was clear that, or at least Galino believed, that it was in, that Ellen was not sitting upright um, throughout this ordeal. Um, she was supine for a considerable period of time, meaning she was on her back, and he could tell that by the way the blood dried mm -hmm. from her nose to, across her cheek to her ear, and that troubled Galino. And this is now when Guy D'Andrea was looking at the case uh, about a year or two after Ellen's death. Now, when you add all of these things up, again, I say... Why are we fighting this? Why haven't the city come forward to say, change the death certificate, let's open this thing up and let's get to the bottom of these issues? So, oh, Joe, the Joe, reporter so, in me so, has Joe, questions. What, Joe, what's the, what is it that they won't, is it, and I'm just going to ask this bluntly, is it that Philadelphia just is mired in corruption? Is that what it is? <laughs> Uh, it's your guess is as good as mine. Um, you know, there can be a suggestion that, in fact, the medical examiner's office wanted to change it, but the, their counsel, the, the city solicitors, advised them not to while the litigation's going on. I don't know. But what I do know is you're a public servant. And as a public servant, you owe a duty to the public at large to do what's right. And it is impossible to look at this case objectively and say, oh, this is a suicide. It is absolutely impossible. There is nobody who would look at this case, look at the actual facts and say, oh, this case doesn't need any more investigation. She clearly committed suicide. It's unbelievable. It's, it, it is. It's a complete bio and it's an insult. It, it, to the, it to makes the me want to smack my head on the wall. Gavin, I'm going to come back to you, Josh, but Gavin, did you know, because you know everything about this case, what uh, Joe just said, which is there was blood in another room, which implies... Uh, that she could have been moved from one room to another, not to mention the position of the body. But did you know this? And what what's your reaction to that? Uh, I did not know that specifically. I know I knew a couple of things because uh, after Ellen, after Ellen's funeral, uh, some people went in to clean out the apartment, and there was evidence that the police had been looking in other rooms. Uh, those people took photos of that and they had shared that with me. So I, I had assumed that the crime scene was larger than the kitchen floor, but uh, specifically I, I did not know that. I do have a question though. I mean, the reporter in me is just like dying here to ask questions here. <laughs> um, as, as far as I understand it, Dr. Osborne, who is not employed by the city of Philadelphia anymore is right. empowered 
by statute to make a change at any time. Is that correct, Joe? Yeah, yeah, Gavin, you're absolutely right. Um, it's a, a peculiar law in Pennsylvania that the actual pathologist in a murder type situation um, or manner of death situation, the pathologist who makes that first determination always has the power to change it when presented with new information. Well, then the question becomes, what do you do when he's not around or she's not around for various reasons? And while it's not specifically said, the office itself can always rescind a death certificate and reissue a new one. So those are the two avenues that are available. But why Osborne, and, and frankly, we've asked him, we begged him to exercise his power and change the manner of death from uh, suicide to anything else, just so this case will then be investigated and we can finally get justice. Nothing. Hmm. No um, I, still, I would like to say something. Yeah, Josh, please hop in. I still have any That's thoughts. all we've asked for. Hmm. And I'm also bringing up another topic that has bothered me right from the beginning. Ellen had bruises on her body consistent with abuse. I, in some fashion, feel that's why she's no longer with us. Because of those bruises, eleven. And you can correct, you can go bruises. anywhere you want with that, but I have nothing more to say. But I do think those bruises are very significant, and no one has ever investigated that. So you have a murderer in Philadelphia, and you have a woman abuser, in my opinion. Joel, it, it's eleven noted in the autopsy report. It's not eleven. It's eleven noted in the autopsy. Oh, I see. What you, you're corroborating what I'm saying. Yes, and Joel yeah. said eleven, right? That there's something say very that, important. Say that again, Gavin. Say that again. The the thing that is very important for everybody to understand is that, uh, in my subjective opinion, Doctor Osborne's uh, his uh, his work product is complete and utter tripe. It's horrible. It's copy and paste bullcrap. He noted eleven. Uh, bruises in various stages of resolution. There are far more many than 11 bruises on Ellen's body. Which are consistent with abuse. Including, including bruises on her neck, including hemorrhages in her neck, including bruises on her knuckles and on her fingers. There, like evidence of her fighting is there. And it's not included in the autopsy report. And so officially, it seems like it, it didn't happen. But in in real life, there's much more. There, there are many more wounds on Ellen's body than are included in the autopsy report. Detectives came to Ms. Farr at the Philadelphia Inquirer and was asked about these bruises. And their response was, wasn't she a Pilates yoga instructor? These are men with 20 years of police experience. I'm quoting them. They don't think, you know, you can take what you want out of all this, but that really irks me, the bruises. that were um, I just, just want to jump abuse. in. It's, um, I'm thinking out loud here. I, uh, I'm going on a book tour, as most people know, and I'm going to be in Philadelphia for that book tour on the 23rd and 24th of May. Um, the email surviving the survivor at Gmail, uh, surviving the survivor at Gmail. One of the things that I wanted to do, uh, and maybe it's not a lot of time, but if people email me and we can get enough people on the 24th, which is a Friday, maybe at noon, and we can gather people up with signs and create some sort of protest to attract the media. I have friends in media in Philadelphia. I will make sure they get there, but email me. So I can get a sense if people are willing in this area. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the people that have kind of spearheaded this is Philadelphia shoulder surgeon. By the way, she gave a ve very generous uh, super sticker um, in memory of Ellen, which I can't get to because I'm a bonehead and I don't know how to pull it up. But um, <laughs> if people are willing to do this, I'm willing to do this on the 24th and I will bring calm and we will march. I don't know if it would be City Hall, Larry Krasner's, office uh maybe joe direct us in the right way carry some yes, signs chester. chester da chester, chester county da now oh, it's yeah. yeah um so 
let's let's think about this collectively. But I want to get back. By the way, um, this question from Rosemary is an important one because Ellen was kind of going through a difficult time uh, when this did happen. She was seeing a psychiatrist. She had no suicidal ideation. Um, but Sandy, maybe you can answer this. Did Ellen have a personal diary and personal computer? Did you go through any of personal belongings? Were you able to find anything about kind of her state of mind or what she was thinking about uh, getting married, you know, about the she notion was keeping of keeping a journal for the psychiatrist and telling them, you know, anything that she took and what she was feeling, which the police have confiscated and still will not return to us. I don't know why they need to keep her journal and her glasses and her boots. The police are withholding so much information. Why? I want to know why. If I lived in Philadelphia, I would not really feel good about the kind of justice and police protection that they're lending their citizens. And as you know, Ellen was a citizen of the city of Philadelphia, paid taxes, and deserves the same justice that Josh Shapiro's family deserves, the same justice that Larry Krasner and his family deserve, and they're not doing their job. They're really only interested in protecting their own interests. Um. I don't know. I, it's I'm literally with this one. You guys know I'm not normally I'm, I'm speechless. Uh, I don't know how Sandy and Josh do it. If this was my child in 13 years past, uh, I, I just would be out of my mind, um, angry. And I don't know what I'd be doing. Um, it's it's so, not easy getting through every day, daily life. But we do the, it. And that, and that's uh, and that's why we have to try to do something. Going to be there. Going to be there with Carm. I'll get Carm on a megaphone. I'll buy her a megaphone. Let's try to do this on at noontime on the twenty fourth of uh, May if we can pull this off. Um, so it's a, not a lot of time, but let's see what we can do. I'll talk to the Philadelphia shoulder surgeon. And uh, Mind of Monsters, by the way, has been. Uh, has messaged me previously about this, but we haven't even gotten into this ruling really. Now, and there's a lot to get through uh, still. And I've got a, an expensive attorney with high billable hours here. So um, <laughs> the most, so, wait, not just high, the most. <laughs> so, so um, oh, that's going to cost me. I know it's going to cost me. Yeah. So Joe, the, the kind of the star witness in all this would be Guy DeAndrea, who I've had on this show. And basically the headline out of this ruling Tuesday is that you are allowed to depose them. There's so kind of the judge to allow this now. Uh, he is the former Philadelphia homicide prosecutor. He's one of the few people that has really reviewed uh, this case. And uh, he has himself serious doubts that Ellen's death uh, was a suicide. Of course, it's been one setback after the other. Uh, Ellen's parents have obviously been very public that uh, they believe she was mm -hmm. murdered. Um, Joe, what do you want now that you have this chance and there's parameters, which I'll get to also in a moment, what do you want to ask Guy DeAndrea, who's been on the show and look, he's a straight shooter. He's a smart guy and uh, he thinks people are up to no good here. But what do you want to ask him? Well, he's had firsthand um, access to the file. Uh, he understands the standards that are used to evaluate the case uh, as to whether it's a crime or a non-crime. Uh, and he has expertise in homicide cases. So we're taking somebody with a great deal of experience who's applied it to this, the facts of this particular case and then adds to it the, the dimension of having spoken directly with the medical examiner and shared this information and has and will be able to share with us the response back then from the medical examiner, which was far more supportive of our position than uh, what has been, you know, uh, presented in recent times. In other words, the medical examiner said, yeah, I, I'm, I'm troubled by this. And I certainly wouldn't oppose changing this to something other than suicide. And pointed out the fact that Ellen's body was moved. That's a critical point that has never been explained. It's never been documented before. But this is the medical examiner, not somebody that the family paid to take a look at it and express an opinion so you can say, well, you know, it's a hired gun. 
This is the city's top medical examiner saying, I'm deeply troubled that this body was moved and nobody can explain how or why it was moved. Um, this question I've never even thought to ask um, from O'Brusty and uh, Josh and Sam, I'm going to ask you, did Sam Goldberg attend the funeral? And if so, what was yeah. the demeanor like? What, 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 he what was and his like? family did attend the funeral. There were people that they listed in the guest list that were not there, but they were handwritten in. Um, they attended. Then when we went back to my mother's home to all be together and have a meal together, that particular element was missing for a very long time. Harrisburg is not a place you get lost in. And it was, they were obviously Wait. gone a very long time doing, I don't know what, but you know, 13 years later, you get a chance to reflect back and see the body language, the behaviors, the snarky crap that's going on. And not just me sees it, but the world sees it. It's all in the universe. I don't understand why the medical examiner, um, I believe Osborne stated in his last deposition that if he knew yeah. then what he knows now, he would have changed it. Kept it. Well, he hasn't done that. Right. He took an oath of office and he hasn't followed through. And then there are two other medical examiners who have eyes, ears, and saw everything and chose to there was, do the wrong thing. I don't know if you remember this, Joe, but Sandy and I met Galino. I wrote a letter. I called up and I made an appointment. And I, Sandy and I had an appointment. And I literally, myself, did Dr. York, Rourke, excuse me, Rourke, file before that date with Ellen came in? Yes. Did she file reports after? Yes. Did she file on that day? No. no. We were literally face to face with this guy. Mm. Uh, do you remember that at all? Oh, I remember you sharing that with me. Yes. But that was before my time, but I know you did share with me that yeah. you met with Dr. Galino. And that's a, a very interesting point that Josh is making. Uh, before Ellen's death and after her death, Lucy Rourke did work for the office. Right. And it's it's recorded because she issued reports and she issued a bill. There's nothing for Ellen. And it strongly suggests that, you know, obviously uh, Lucy Rourke was working for the office but the fact that there is no report and the fact that there is no invoice and the fact that Dr. Roar, uh, Lucy Rourke denied uh, act, you know, being involved in the matter right. when she was interviewed way back by the local newspaper, well, that strongly suggests that the, she wasn't involved in this. But that's um, one of the key points wait, of them wait, wait, saying wait, wait. that yeah, the wasn't cause there and yet, of yet, death. yet in the first autopsy or whatever. Wasn't she quoted in a handwritten note? Well, there's an entry in the um, the uh, autopsy report that was issued by um, uh, Dr. Uh, Osborne. But keep something in mind. That document is a fluid document. So once Ellen was brought to the medical examiner's office, information is added to that document as mm. time goes on. Okay. And that entry, uh, that document also includes the entry that the fiance was escorted. Hmm. Right. That's from, nobody knows where the hell that came. So from. it seems like Olszewski is the only source of somebody saying that that right, Mr. Goldberg was escorted by Mr. Hanlon. Well, but Osborne testified that there was a meeting with the police department and a member of the district attorney's office, and he believed it was at that meeting. That it, that it was represented that the fiance had been escorted. Now, here's the crazy thing. We now have the Philadelphia Police Department file. 
And Joel, if you can, can you put up your chronology that you had there? Yeah, I'm going to put it real quick. While this is up, people are asking, uh, where is he today? Sam Goldberg, he got remarried, has kids, and is uh, working for a golf uh, organization. I believe it's Live, Saudi Arabian funded golf uh, organization. He was never married to Ellen. He's only been married once that we know of. Yes. And and um, he's, you know, it, it boggles Gavin, I just want to ask you, and I'll put that up in one second, Joe, I promise. But Gavin, in your opinion, I mean, New York City uh, has a lot of intrepid reporters. I've never seen a camera in this guy's face asking him any questions at any time. <laughs> Why not? I've I've never seen anybody do that either, but I get texted pictures of him pretty frequently. You do? You do? do. And what's, yeah, he, and what's do. he up to? What's he up to? <laughs> and how's he looking? Uh, he looks like a man of his age, enjoying a pretty good life and... Uh, with a beautiful spouse and beautiful children. The first reporter tried to, he actually went to his apartment and slipped uh, letters under his door to try and get to talk to him. Yeah. Uh, he does not talk to guy, reporter. You need, you need to get a microphone and get in this guy's face. I wish I was still a Fox 5 because I would do it. Um, but someone needs to do it. And someone in New York City needs to get on this. Here's the chronology, Joe. Well, you, you see there that uh, February 28th, police department declares death. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually now have revised the chronology. Um, Ellen is, is found dead on January 26th. January 27th, the autopsy is completed. Uh, probably by mid-afternoon, um, Osborne declares it's a homicide. Um, and notification of it gets to the police uh, probably later that night. On the 28th, the police go right to the medical examiner's office. And according to the police notes, they were already suggesting that this isn't a homicide, but something else. There is a discussion with Osborne. Um, two days later, I, I guess would be February 1st, mm. Galeno, Osborne, and the police meet again. And at that meeting, Galeno suggests, well, yeah, she could probably self-administer these wounds uh, why don't you bring in Lucy Rourke or talk to Lucy Rourke? The police records then show the very next day that uh, Galeno, Galeno, oh, excuse me, uh, Osborne calls uh, the uh, police officer and says, yeah, I'm changing it to a suicide. That's how compressed the chronology is and the determination of suicide was made. The death certificate will not be altered or changed until April. Why? Why? <laughs> it makes no sense whatsoever. But it was that fast. And that that review by Lucy Rourke was done apparently, allegedly, that quickly that they were able to say, yeah, we're going to make it a suicide. It's, it's Lucy funny. Rourke claims she never saw Ellen. Yeah. And, and Gavin, feel free because I know the reporter in you, if you want to jump in at any time. I, I just want to quickly go through some of what uh, Guy D'Andrea, so he is this star witness now that Joe Pedraza and the, and the Greenbergs have been given permission um, to she depose. And by the way, the, uh, the, the judge uh, invoked some, you know, you can't talk to him for more than four hours and we can ask Joe about <laughs> that. There's restrictions. Of course they did that. Um, right. So, you know, it, it was a win, but with parameters, but uh, Guy D'Andrea on this show and, and publicly has said, look, um, he says that uh, the crime showed that Ellen's spine was pierced. Uh, he says that she would have been immediately incapacitated. She never would have been able to stab herself. This is his quote. And I direct quote here. She would not have been able to continue to stab herself. She would not have been able to stab herself in the chest. A uh, guy then went on to say that he believes her body was moved after her death. Um, and we talked about this. She went... Uh, according to Guy, uh, when Ellen was found, and, and Joe can corroborate this, she was in a seated position, but the traces of blood, so she's sitting up, but the blood is going this way, right. horizontally, as though she was laying down. Um, so none of this makes sense. Um, the quote about the blood on the face from Guy D'Andrea, and this is a direct quote again, she must have been laying long enough on her side for the blood to run in that direction as well as long enough that it wouldn't drag or drip when she was in a seated position. Um, police and 
the fiance, say that Ellen's body wasn't moved until after crime scene investigators reviewed the scene. But uh, sounds like that's a bunch of you know what. Um, it came up, DeAndrea says, uh, we've seen Stranger Things. Um, but he says, but How never do you perform things. CPR when a, uh, yeah. the victim is sitting up. Yeah. How do you do that? Uh, speaking, speaking of that, Gavin, tell us about the 911 call. Cause if oh, I don't okay. have it, I should have had it queued up. But when you hear him making the 911 call, and, and I had uh, Scott Duffy on here, former FBI agent, he says it just didn't smell right. But I tell enjoyed us that episode. Yeah. No, the 911 call to me was not a uh, Oscar worthy of performance i i personally am not even convinced he was in the room while he was on uh the phone with 911 um the other thing that was unconvincing about that was that he supposedly could not see a giant handle of a cutco right. 1721 coming out of her chest and he was shocked when he tried to unzip her hoodie and it wouldn't unzip because, oh my goodness, there's a knife in her chest. Not to mention that the knife is two inches away from the zip. I mean, everything about it is just Terrible. wrong. Boy. Is just wrong. So, I mean, just look at these pictures. The, these are the, the ones on the bottom right are the ones that Guy DeAndre is talking about. Right. Um, and, and listen, this is very hard. The parents are here, but trust me, I've talked to Josh and Sandy and they've sadly heard this for 13 years. So I think that's part of the reason Sandy's kind of numb. Um, but it, on shows like this, it's got to be talked about. Um, I, I've seen some people saying that they are now subscribing to Gavin's channel. Please do that. Um, he, he covers this like no one else. I mean, we don't hold a candle to him when it comes to his coverage of this. Um, you know, I'd like to do more and hope that I do more. And uh, we will try to do more. Um, Back to this now, um, Joe. So they put restrictions on you. Um, I, I just I'm going to take this down, but just just look at the number of knives on the left side, and they're calling this a suicide with a gash on the head and two knives in a in a spinal. Look uh, at the multiple um, directions. Yeah. Look at the multiple angles. Yeah. Look at the twisting of the knife. Oh, by the way, one was sur there's two knives. There are serrated wounds and straight knife blade wounds. It's uh smooth edge and jagged serrated, edge serrated. wounds. Yeah. yeah, tough to look at. And uh, this person, uh, I got to know, physically impossible. Um, so, Joe, some more questions for you. Um, <laughs> the city now says that they could still seek immunity um, because defendants are quote unquote government officials. Yeah. And then they said... The scope of the questioning that you can do uh, with Guy D'Andrea is limited, cannot exceed four hours. Why? Why does it have to be limited? Uh, you know, that was something that I think the court felt um, just uh, as a compromise. Uh, let me say this to you with Guy. Guy is so familiar with the case. Uh, we can certainly get his deposition done within that time. And I don't feel as though we're going to be prejudiced whatsoever with the time limitation. Um, I think Her Honor also was a little confused as to whether there were going to be privileges. You know, Guy was an assistant district attorney, and there are what they call deliberative uh, privileges so as to uh, perhaps prevent him from speaking out. But since the, uh, the DA's office has not invoked any privilege, they're all waived. So he's going to be able to fr uh, uh, freely speak. You know, normally when you depose a lawyer, there's privileges involved. And a, a lot of courts look at that and say, well, you know, are, are we wasting time? Because he's just going to be instructed not to answer it because it's privileged. Uh, this will not be one of those cases because the DA's office has not asserted a privilege and Guy is going to be free to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't see that, again, as constricting us at all. I think we're going to be fine. We need to get him on record. Because remember, this case is about public officials conspiring to hide a homicide. We need to show and create the continuum of this is what was known, this is what's been revealed, and at what point do these people owe an obligation to say, enough, you're right, we gotta change this. And if you don't change it, why haven't you changed it? 
that's what we need to prove right now. And we start out with Guy, with his expert uh, review based on by, about, you know, being a former prosecutor. But then more importantly, his interaction with Dr. Galino. I mean, we're going to be able to establish that since 2015, Dr. Galino has been suspicious at, 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 at least. And I think you can probably describe it as more as we went forward in revealing evidence to the point that he asked for an independent neuro examination. Right. And he got those findings. And it's very interesting that he instructed that neuropathologist not to create a report. Hey, hey Joe, uh, speaking of the constraints that Judge Carpenter put on you, one of them was a time constraint uh, as far as getting the depositions done by a certain day. Are you just looking to depose Mr. Dandria or will there be others that you try to depose before that May something deadline? Yeah, May 4th. Gavin, you stole my question. But, ah, sorry. But, but I'm glad you stole it. I'm glad. <laughs> well, and I, I'm glad you raised this because, uh, uh, frankly, uh, we have new representatives from the city. Um at least people we have not had in, uh, in the solicitor's office who we had not dealt with before. They're relatively new to the case. Um, because of that May 4th deadline that the court said, I'm not going to extend this. Uh, the city representatives have also said to us that we, by agreement, will work beyond that. So the answer is we are going to get all the depositions in, including depositions of Galeno, Emery, and Osborne. Um, we also want to see if we can get former ADA, uh, Ann Pontario. Hmm. She uh, seems to have taken a look at this case and given her pointed questions to the police before that meeting. Um, she really did a, a thorough exam. And we'd like to hear from her. Uh, what was the police explanation as to why there's no report by Lucy Rourke and why there was no examination done of the blood on pillows in another room? You know, she really did a thorough job. So I think she can add to our, our knowledge of the case, you know, in addition. Joe, so, are, you uh, already, are you already working on your line of questioning for these uh, deposies? <laughs> Joel, I've been living this case for almost five years. We've been up to the, we've got, we've been up to the Supreme Court uh, where we are now. We've been through appellate courts. We've been in front of numerous judges. We've gotten over summary judgment. We've beaten all of the privileges Kudos to the judicial bench in Philadelphia for being strong and not allowing this case to just be derailed for the sake of being derailed. It took several judges. Recently, it's Judge Carpenter. But before that, there were other judges who refused to just let this case go away because they're very, very bothered by it. And that's important. It's nice to know that our jurists will stand up, go, go against the current, and say, no, well, let's see where this is going to go. Let's see what the facts are. And let's make sure justice gets done for this family. Everyone should be bothered by this. Um, by the way, I'd love to be a fly on the wall in uh, Sam Goldberg's house with his wife. Because I can tell you this, I, I'm no, I'm no uh, therapist. My mother is. But uh, people um, who come from domestic violence situations, uh, they don't change their stripes. A, le a leopard does not change its spots. So I'm so curious what is going on in that marriage. Um, and that's another reason I think uh, this guy's got to feel a little bit of pressure from the media. I hope it happens. Sandy, um, when this was all announced, uh, when there was this hearing just this week, um, one of the glaring omissions was the city of Philadelphia. They refused to respond. Does that irritate you that you that you're, you're not hearing from the city saying some sort of giving I'm some sort of official with statement. the city? Good. I'm disappointed with the city. And I don't know why the people that live there and pay their taxes aren't more outraged. Because mm -hmm. Ellen is just the face of this big problem. A hundred percent. 100%. Um, Gavin, to you, since you know all the background on this, uh, could some people, multiple people have asked this, please answer how the cousin was able to take all the electronics from the apartment. I think it was that night or they went back, but they took laptops and cell phones, I believe. Uncle. And, uncle. and, and had a professional cleaning crew come in, right, Gavin? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the story ish. Uh, that's mostly accurate. Yeah. Let's so go, let Joe, he has more knowledge of who did Yeah, go what. for it, Joe. No, Gavin, go. You, you're definitely on top of this aspect. <laughs> um, 
Okay, it was so, uncle who took uh, everything. Ellen, Everyone's so polite. Gavin, Ellen, was, Ellen was murdered on the 26th. Um, the following day, the it was the apartment manager that called up asking if she could let family into the apartment. She called the police department asking if she could let family in the apartment who said that they wanted to get things for Mr. Goldberg, his suit and so forth for the, for Ellen's funeral. It was the police who gave her the crime scene cleanup company's contact information. It was her who called and had the crime scene cleaned and then let with the police's blessing, uh, Mr. Schwartzman, both Mr. Schwartzman into the apartment to take the things that they took, which did include electronics that belonged to Ellen, her laptops, her phone. So they never took the engagement ring, did they? They did not. Which and then out. it was when was Joe was talking time. about that compressed timeline, it wasn't until the day after that, that the police got a warrant to go back into the apartment and do a search of the apartment. And that's one of the things that continues to kill me. I've said it to you, Joel, before a couple times, but um, one of the things that I really hate about the way that this has been handled in the media in Philadelphia since 2011 is every time a local Philadelphia TV company, a TV, like a news organization shows file footage of, uh, you know, when they're talking about Ellen's case and they're showing file footage from 2011, they're showing file footage of the police doing their job after the scene had already been cleaned. It, it makes this impression that the police were on top of things. They were in they there were and they not. were doing their job and they just weren't. It, it bothers me. Yeah. Sure. And just, I mean, just imagine if a crime scene is clean back to the civil suit. So I want to hit a bunch of points here. Um, the civil suit and Joe can speak on this alleges conspiracy among Philly detectives, the medical examiner, assistant district attorneys, one assistant district attorney has already been dropped from the lawsuit because a previous judge argued uh, that uh, that person deserved immunity. I um, immunity. Say again. I immunity. Okay, Joe, explain that. Well, there's a an immunity, which means uh, you're you're get out of jail free card. Let's put it that way. You can't be sued and held responsible. Um, in Pennsylvania, it's called a high official immunity for people in public positions performing public functions. Uh, as to the ADA who was uh, released from the case, the court felt that there was insufficient uh, evidence to show that this person was involved in a conspiracy to cover up this homicide. Um, as it's turned out, it's, it was in uh, Pontario. And now that we have the police department file, there seems to be a good basis to let her out of this case because she seemed to have been troubled like we are by uh, the, the determination of suicide. We don't believe that the privilege applies because we're alleging that these officials have committed a crime and, it, and you are not acting as a public official by violating the law, let's put it that way. So the privilege won't apply, but, but here's the wrinkle. And I think Judge Carpenter understood this too. If the court granted high immunity, our case would be thrown out and we'd be up on appeal for the next four or five years and we would lose momentum and this would drag on for you know con considerably more time. But even if the court denies immunity, that can be taken up on appeal. So you're, from an appeal standpoint, you're in a no-win situation here. And I thought that Judge Carpenter was brilliant in how she handled it. She said that, hey, um, that was dealt with over 30 days ago, so that issue is no longer in front of me. You can raise that uh, later in this case when all of the discovery is done and all the facts are in front of me, and then I'll decide whether there is high official immunity or not. But that, that train left the station a long time ago, and I'm not going to allow the city to get a decision that they can take an appeal uh, one way or the other. So for us, that was truly the great win on Tuesday with the court, because if the court had ruled one way or the other on high official immunity, we would now be talking about getting prepared to go up on appeal and spending the next three to four years fighting over high official immunity 
versus, you know, let's get to the crux of this case, the facts and let a jury decide it. So that was very critical for us. And, you know, and kudos to Judge Carpenter for really seeing through the city's position of another roadblock, a legal road, uh, roadblock to keep the family from, you know, getting justice. And that, that was the important thing. Yeah. Um, Sandy, here's a comment. I believe that Ellen probably told Sam she wanted out. Did you have any sense that she was having a uh, cold feet or second thoughts no. about the marriage? No, 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 that's not, not true. At the, time, at the time. No, I had no idea. I felt like everything I could do and she could do was in place. And I had no idea what kind of life she was living behind closed doors. Yeah. And I've had 13 years to think about this. But at the time, no, I had no idea, unfortunately. I've, I've examined Ellen's life a little bit on that. I, 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 agree, with, I agree with Sandy that if, if Ellen did want out of that marriage, she was not communicating it certainly to Josh and Sandy and really not communicating it to anybody else. I would not like to discuss this any further. You got yeah. it. Yeah. No, I, I, I hear it's sensitive. Um, we will move it forward from here. Um, so Josh and Sandy, uh, Joe, they also want Ellen's official manner of death to be changed from suicide to homicide. Uh, there was a whole issue with this circuit court in the Commonwealth. And uh, I, I guess it's going to be taken up. There was a panel ruling. It was a split decision that went against them. But now the Supreme Court uh, might take this up. Uh, can you just explain that aspect a little bit? Sure. In Pennsylvania, besides uh, uh, matters that aren't uh, here involved, um, the Supreme Court only takes cases per their discretion. So mm -hmm. you have to file a document that says, you know, hey, Supreme Court, we think this is an important issue across the state, and we think that you should say yes and let it come up to you for a decision. That's where we are with the Supreme Court. Um, after the intermediate appellate court uh, two to one decision against us was issued, um, Sandy and Josh decided this is too important. Let's ask the Supreme Court to exercise that discretion and take the appeal and decide whether we have standing or not, as well as others, you know, who will be unfortunately in this predicament down the road. Uh, we're still waiting. Um, the matter was ripe for decision as of December. So it's been what, four months, a little over four months. Uh, not unusual because, you know, obviously the Supreme Court gets a lot of matters and really has to determine which ones, given its limited time and resources, it can take in a year. But we're hopeful. We're very hopeful. So it's been uh, hard to believe. Over 13 years, Josh and Sandy have spent over a half a million dollars. Uh, I'm going to put the GoFundMe link. Um, I meant to have it up here. It'll be in the show summary. All you have to do is go into the show summary, and I will tweet out the link and put it on. Tweet it out at Podcast STS, Instagram, at Surviving the Survivor. Um, there was also a secret meeting, Gavin. Uh, the Greenberg's conspiracy suit, it centers on this meeting or meeting among investigating police, at least one prosecutor, two medical examiner officials. Uh, talk to us about this meeting and when it was, what it was about, what happened, Gavin. Well, I think Joe already kind of told us a little bit about that, but yep. Uh, actually, I'm way more comfortable having Joe talk about that. Because just <laughs> so can, you just, can you just reiterate? Because... Uh, you know, I yeah. want that. That's that's obviously an important point. This is the meeting that occurred like, um, well, what, the first meeting occurred um, two days after Ellen's death. And then the next occurred the next day after that meeting. And the following day, it's when Osborne on February 2nd, I guess, uh, advises the police, I'm going to change it to a suicide. And this is a meeting where a lot of, now you. we know, police cool. department officials uh, uh, attend. Um, one is high ranking as a lieutenant attends and uh, it, we're, we're gathering from the notes, but we're going to have to ask the participants. Um, it seems as though the police was championing suicide. 
and you wanted that homicide uh, determination changed. And it also seems that at that time uh, they were getting support from Dr. Galino um, to, you know, change it to suicide, but it was left with Dr. Osborne. But if you look at this compressed timeline, you have the 26th is when Ellen dies. You know, the 27th is when uh, Osborne declares it a homicide later in the day. The 28th is the first meeting. Then on February 1st is this other meeting where Galino suggests, hey, uh, let's bring in uh, Lucy Rourke and get her view. Mm -hmm. And the very next day, uh, uh, Osborne claims to have consulted with this expert and says, I'm going to be changing the death certificate. It's an awful lot of, uh, well, first off, it's a critical decision being made in a short period of time with exceptionally limited information available to the participants. That's that's a very compressed, very fast process. And Joe, Almost you found out about this by deposing Osborne and Gulino, right? This was this was not known information. It was not known. It was mentioned uh, at that deposition, Gavin. You're right, but we didn't know the particulars until the police department file, which we just got like two months ago. Yeah. And we saw these notes, and it began to you know come together what transpired. So, uh, you know, there's so even our complaint needs to be adjusted because there's new facts that we didn't know at the time that we were filing the uh, complaint. Yeah. Wow. Well, cliches are cliches for a reason, I guess. They say where there's smoke, there's fire and there's just a whirlwind of smoke in this entire case. It reeks. It reeks to high. You know what? And um, I'm glad that the Greenbergs have. Uh, Joe Pedraza and also Gavin Fish on their side. Um, I'm confident we're going to get to the bottom of this. Um, we've been covering the uh, Dan Markell case out of Tallahassee, and that uh, murder occurred in 2014, and justice is just being served now with the matriarch of that family about to go uh, on trial in September. And I am fully confident that Joe Pedraza, you can see here, uh, and Guy DeAndrea. Guy DeAndrea is a top-notch guy, and uh, you can tell that uh, Joe Pedraza knows his stuff uh, inside out, and he's been by the uh, Greenberg side for, uh, the, as you heard, the better part of five years working on this. So uh, kudos to him. Uh, Gavin Fish also uh, has reported on this like no one else. Please subscribe to his YouTube channel. Gavin, people were asking, just Gavin Fish YouTube? I mean, they just Yeah, just search my name. You'll find okay. me. There you go, Gavin and Fish. Like fish I would like to say one thing. Uh, you're, yeah, go ahead, Josh. I'll you're do it quickly. Word, if it wasn't for the media, we wouldn't be here. And Sandy and I want to thank anybody and everybody in the media, and that includes the podcasters also, who have kept this case alive. We could not have done it alone. Uh, well, I'll say this. We're now 108,000 strong here at STS had over 2 million views the last couple of months. So uh, please email me, surviving the survivor at Gmail. I hope to get flooded with emails. Like I said, uh, May 24th with Carm in Philly would be wild uh, to uh, bring this to the media's attention. I have contacts in Philly that I can uh, give a heads up to um, if we're able. And I'll talk to the uh, shoulder surgeon so hard for me to say that. I will talk to her uh, when she's out of the OR and try to make that happen. But Gavin Fish is a journalist, a documentarian, a YouTuber, a champion for victims of violent crimes, as you just saw here, giving voice to the voiceless, which is what journalists are supposed to do. Uh, many are too worried about their uh, makeup or their hairspray or their tie knot, but uh, hopefully that will get to the bottom of this. Gavin, I guess for you, What's the biggest question you have remaining tonight for Joe Pedraza and your final thoughts? Well, that is a, that is a very good question. Um, what I've appreciated about Joe is that he's staying completely focused on, on the case. Very focused. Uh, it's very easy for us to get, uh, sidetracked by uh by all the other stuff around it the stuff that is so egregious the stuff that is so offensive the 20 knife wounds the two that happened post-mortem the blood running against gravity on her face all of those things are just very easy to uh 
first, I mean, we righteously feel indignant about it, but I'm really appreciative that Joe and his team are staying laser focused on the goal to prove that there is a conspiracy to cover up the murder of Ellen Greenberg. So I appreciate the work you're doing, Joe. Thanks for doing that. We, the way, there's, there's a real quick, there's a comment here. Gavin is sticking his toe into the Karen retrial tonight. Bring yes, a defibrillator for when Gavin sees that. Gavin, good luck with that. I've covered it and uh, my wildest show ever. That's one of the most divisive cases. We're actually going to cover that gavel to gavel on STS, but I don't know how much uh, commentary we're doing. I'm just going to let my that baptism go. is tonight. We'll see how deep the pool is. Well, it's pretty deep. I'll warn you of that right now. That's another crazy case, but um, I obviously have to thank Joe Pedraza. Um, he's a partner with the law firm Lamb McEarlane PC practices in the specialties of complex civil litigation, commercial litigation. All you need to know is he's a fine attorney and he's the man who is going to hopefully get justice here uh, Joe, a big win for you. You're going to get to depose Guy DeAndrea and some of these other uh, big players. What What are the next steps? I mean, does this then go um, at some point to a uh, jury, uh, this civil suit? How does it work? Well, that's that's a great question, Joel. And that's part of what the decision by uh, Judge Carpenter this week, um, by saying that we are going to stay on track with the, what we call the case management deadlines that have been set in this case. Uh, we will uh, do discovery. Uh, there'll be some pretrial activity in July, but this case will be set for trial this fall. Right. So we will finally be getting to the end line one way or the other, but Sandy and Josh will finally be able, hopefully uh, we'll, won't have any adverse rulings, but we'll be able to present our case and let 12 people in Philadelphia decide whether we're right or wrong. And Joe, do they let cameras in these Philly courtrooms or uh, I have a feeling they don't? They don't. Um, and yeah. there's been some requests, even some of the oral arguments, uh, there were requests made. But, you know, the, the courtrooms are such that uh, media can participate yeah. uh, to a certain extent. Um, and the last time we were supposed to have a trial, there were media requests to bring cameras in. And you should appeal to the judge to have a stream that he runs out of the courtroom. That way he doesn't have to worry about the media, full, you know, putzing around. Uh, that's my suggestion to petition the court to have their own stream. Well, and Joel, they, they were doing that during the pandemic. So I would not be surprised if media inquiries now uh, might be handled the same way that the courts were being run with the pandemic. Just as you're saying that you could stream through so that you'll have a, uh, you know, a feed that the media will have access to. But we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. Right now, it's getting the facts, hammering the case down, putting our best foot forward, convincing the court that this case has merit to go to a jury, and then convincing a jury that we're right. And that's By the way, Joe, on. that is not a Philly accent. You from uh, you're there upstate New York or Chicago? Am I right? <laughs> upstate New York, actually. Uh, you're, really? Good name. Where are you from? Look at me. Uh, outside of Buffalo, uh, a oh. little town called Elma. It's probably my most proud moment on this podcast that I uh, just got. I lived in uh, Manlius for my dad did his residency in medical school in uh, that's right next to it's a suburb of Syracuse. OK, um, so I knew that wasn't a Philly accent because, you know, Philly accents when you hear them. I told everyone I was making uh, travel plans for the book tour and I finally uh flying and taking some trains i call amtrak and the woman's like how can i help you and i was like you got to be from jersey or philly and she's like oh i'm from philly uh so that, uh, yeah people You'll never guess where josh is from i it <laughs> J -Josh. blows my mind can't believe long island can't even believe it josh <laughs> um of course on that note josh just walked out so uh i'm gonna give uh, i think he's here he just stepped away for a moment but um Sandy, I appreciate you being here. Um, we need to do more and more shows on this. Um, it's my fault that we're not doing more, but I'm going to stay on this, especially uh, once this trial hopefully gets going uh, in the fall. We will be doing that, uh, hopefully gavel to gavel with shows every single night. But um, I just want to give you uh, your final say here, Sandy. And as you're talking, I want to put this up, not block your face, but please reach out to these elected officials let them know, bother them, 
annoy them. That's what the citizens of this great country are supposed to do. And the citizens of the Commonwealth annoy the crap out of them and tell them I said so. Uh, <laughs> Sandy, your final thoughts tonight. I am so grateful for the, the amount of love that everyone has shown us, the amount of support and every little thing, every little inch that we make is worthwhile. And I, where I am now, I can look back and lay my head on my pillow knowing that we have been doing everything we can. I think right now people know Ellen did not commit suicide but now we got to take, we need the touchdown. Yep. Um, and thank you for everything that you, you're all doing. I'm eternally grateful. Um, I mean, I've done a drop in the bucket relative to these two, to Gavin and obviously Joe doing the uh, serious legal work here. But uh, however we can help, you let us know. Uh, I'm in touch just so everyone knows pretty pretty frequently with Sandy and Josh, mo mostly Sandy more than Josh. Um, and uh, whatever we can do, Sandy, we are here. Joe, whatever we can do for you um, to help spread uh, the word media-wise, please let us know. And uh, Gavin Fish, you're, uh, as my mother would say, a gentleman and a scholar. Uh, stay strong, keep reporting. And uh, we've got to look at these photos. I mean, we, by the way, what color were Ellen's eyes? They, they look different to me in different pictures. I think um, she had contacts in there. <laughs> are, they, are they brown? Her eyes were hazel, so they looked a little brown, a little green, but the, those were contacts. I'm quite certain. <laughs> um, so uh, there is Ellen Greenberg. Um, such a tragic case, but we're going to get to the bottom of this. Joe is going to be the superhero in this. Guy DeAndrea, they're going to step up. They're going to get justice in this case. Until then, love you, America. Love you, Western Pennsylvania. Love you, upstate New York. Love you, Philadelphia. Love you, Florida, where Sandy and Josh are. Love you, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And, of course, uh, please, let's get justice for Ellen Greenberg. That's what this is all about. Panel, please stick around for one second.